So this is going to be a, a, a different kind of talk. It's going to be exploratory and informal, especially compared to you know the preparation shown by prior speakers. Let me explain that I had planned to give a, your kind of st st standard book talk, but uh, it dawned on me that that was old material, and you know we've heard people refute it already in the course of the day. Uh, and I also was aware that it, it was important to write an, a new paper for a volume that is supposed to come out of this event. I haven't done so, but I, I wanted to share you know, some basic ideas about one with you uh, in raw form just to get your thoughts so I can get to work. Um, as I see it, the, the, the debate around liberalism today has settled into now a, a kind of familiar standoff. There are those who excoriate and there are those who extenuate in more humble terms. There are those who are critics of liberalism and propose getting rid of it. And there are apologists who say it's all right and worth retaining. And I've, I've tried to take a, a different route. It's a third way I could say. It's not the same one already mentioned today, but it consists of proposed tough love for liberalism rather than uh, celebrating it or rejecting it. But uh, I can't be said that I've been all that successful because the debate really is uh, between liberals and post-liberals. My position hasn't fared all that well. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm going to uh, try a somewhat different uh, approach, which is going to be based on something I, I don't think has been done, uh, at least not lately, um, uh, but that I think is quite interesting, which is what you might call the comparative history of crises of liberalism, because we're not in the first one, uh, obviously. Now, it's obvious, too, that there have been analogies, constant analogies, between whatever you think is going on in our time and prior moments. But maybe they've been to the wrong moment, or at least there's not only one crisis of liberalism uh, before ours. Uh, the most, I think, cited reference point uh, has been the 1930s. And, it, and in a certain way, it's preferred um, maybe the interwar period more generally um, because it's almost as if electively in the face of anti-liberalism or post-liberalism, many liberals have, have liked to imagine themselves uh, on the brink of regime change. Uh, and uh, it, it's it might be more useful to look elsewhere rather than, let's say, accept the framing, the comparative framing that has been hegemonic among liberals that it's January 1933, which many liberals declared after Donald Trump was elected in 2016. Uh, or later that uh, liberalism is in the midst of its World War II resistance era which, again, many have thought, especially between 2016 and 2020, while Donald Trump was president, but even, you know, indefinitely. And I wonder if it might be interesting to work with a different comparison. Uh, and so I'm going to dwell in this talk on the crisis, theoretically at least, and self-defense of liberalism in the later Cold War, the last decade of the Cold War. Um, because there was, at, at a minimum, theoretically, a very big debate about liberalism. Uh, and many were, uh, were part of it. Many were formed by it who had any uh, exposure to it if they're old enough um, and lived through the 1980s or even early 1990s. Now, why pursue this tactic? Um, well, for one thing, I, I just think it's interesting as, as someone, as a, an intellectual historian, to have as, as a specimen a prior debate in which liberalism was said to be in crisis and some defended 
it in the face of its critics because we'll maybe be able to understand some new things or maybe you know, potentially new things about our own crisis by noting or having a, a discussion of the similarities and differences. Um, I think that comparison is interesting in itself, but I also have a strategic reason for engaging in the exercise uh, in the form I'm going to try, which is that we might be even better positioned by undertaking this exercise just to come to the conclusions I've offered unsuccessfully before. Uh, that today, in our current crisis of liberalism, our primary task is, is not to junk it yet, uh, but instead to, to ask what would be involved in redeeming the credibility of liberalism after an era of self-imposed mistakes, at least mostly self-imposed mistakes. I do think it might be the last chance uh, for liberalism to, to do so, to make itself appealing to voters, but also credible intellectually and spiritually even. Uh, but even if it's not, I think uh, that's what I've been arguing for, that liberalism should, should, does have a chance to improve itself uh, and it should take that opportunity. And I'll try to argue for that conclusion by looking at this earlier debate. So I'm going to talk chiefly as a kind of proxy for the debate of that uh, era of the 1970s, 80s, a little bit into the 90s at uh, a very uh, important uh, political theorist, historian of political thought, whatever you want to call him, named Stephen Holmes. Uh, he was born in, in 1948. He actually did a doctorate at Yale, confirming uh, Patrick Deneen's story that it's the epicenter. It's the epicenter of everything good and bad. Uh, interestingly, I mean, if you're a German, he uh, was was trained by a German in the philosophy department at Yale, so he has a philosophy PhD, and he wrote his dissertation uh, on. Uh, Habermas and Luhmann and the concept of legitimation in this period, but he never published it, and I don't know why that is. I should ask him. Uh, but what he ended up doing is write, rewriting uh, a first book uh, about uh, the French liberal Benjamin Constant, to which I'll return. And uh, then he became, for a bit, a junior faculty member at Harvard University, where he became, he never having been his, her student, but a devotee and follower of the renowned Cold War liberal thinker, Judas Schlar. Um, Holmes was a, is a gifted writer, um, and uh, he became a kind of enfant terrible of a, a particular liberal tendency of the 1980s. And uh, I think most notably, a, a take no prisoners polemicist on behalf of liberalism uh, against all of its critics. He, he taught uh, then for a while at the University of Chicago and ultimately at Princeton, where he briefly overlapped with Professor Patrick Deneen. And now he's at New York University, uh, alive and well. In fact, I'm, I'm honor bound to mention that Steve uh, wrote a, an incredibly brutal takedown of my own recent book, uh, Liberalism Against Itself, uh, but I'm not bitter. Uh, and, and in fact, I just want to be very clear, this, this talk is not at all a response, even indirectly, to it. Um, I have tons of respect for Stephen Holmes, and I really just want to take him as a kind of proxy for thinking about the, the debate among political theorists about the future of liberalism uh, in a bygone moment of the 1980s and into the 1990s. Uh, in 1993, he published what was, let's say, a, a revised version of many of those book reviews with some other material uh, as the book Anatomy of Anti-Liberalism. Uh, and uh, he had written many of those reviews in the New Republic, uh, a magazine that has already been mentioned numerous times in this conference because it's really thanks to the New Republic that there ever has been something in America called liberalism, which is the magazine after World War I popularized that word um, in the United States. But then 
I think, uh, in the 1970s uh, uh, through 90s, mm -hmm. under the stewardship of particular people, uh, became a kind of outpost of the renewal of Cold War liberalism. Um, and Holmes wrote for it and, uh, and served its mission. I think, incidentally, this book just proves just how many critics of liberalism there were uh, at the end of the Cold War. Um, and he, he helpfully produces a kind of compendium of, of at least one rendition of, of uh, just all the voices that there were uh, against liberalism long before the Adrians and Patricks of the world made the idea of a crisis of liberalism famous again and current. And it's just very interesting that that debate more or less died and disappeared for a couple of decades um, until, until our time. So uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, Holmes's project, he uh, had a very interesting s set of enemies, uh, mostly right but also left. There was Alistair McIntyre, the, uh, the famous neo-Thomist Roman Catholic a thinker. There was Roberto Unger, probably unknown to most of you, uh, but quite prominent in the 1970s and 80s. He also had Catholic roots, but uh, it became quite distant from them and, and identified with the countercultural left um, and also dropped any fundamental opposition to uh, liberalism, which had marked his earliest book in 1975 called knowledge and, and politics, but far from crediting Unger with evolving, Holmes thought that he remained an anti-liberal in spite of his protestations. And then including Unger's later work in his broadside against critics of liberalism allowed uh, Holmes's own book to transcend just being an attack on the right, um, since Holmes really wanted to show that there are a variety of anti-liberalisms that, in a sense, cross the political spectrum. Uh, and, and then there were others. Uh, there was Christopher Lash. Uh, there was uh, the communitarians, enormously uh, influential at the time, uh, like Michael Sandel and Charles Taylor, whom, uh, whom Holmes also uh, vilified. Interestingly, Holmes treated all of these figures as what he called soft anti-liberals. Uh, and they were knockoffs, according to Holmes's scheme, of so-called hard anti-liberals that he also took up. Figures from earlier in the 20th century, which, who he said were much more honest about abandoning liberalism, uh, already Joseph de Mestre in the, in the 19th century had uh, sounded the anti-liberal call, but then there was Carl Schmitt and a whole chapter on Leo Strauss. Uh, and very interestingly, just given what we've heard, Holmes interpreted Leo Strauss as a neo-Nietzschean elitist, except that he was amongst the anti-liberals, one of the chief hard anti-liberals, not a liberal Cold War or other. Now, one thing you'll immediately notice that in this cast of characters, uh, there's no one on the left other than, well, if you count Lash or an Unger, but there's no Marxism. Um, and partly that's maybe the marginality of, of, of Marx in America then and perhaps even now. But uh, I think it's a revealing fact that uh, you could write a whole book about the modern tradition of anti-liberalism and leave out Marxism, a fact to which I'll come back later in the end. Now, I, won't, I won't, don't want to provide a book review of Holmes's book. I really just want to think about um, how his understanding of what was going on in the 1970s and 80s, finally published in the early 90s, might help us think about our own uh, situation. Um, but I'll say one or two things just as a general uh, matter. 
he acknowledged that his device of saying there is an anti-liberal tradition characterized by its hard early wing and its soft later wing uh, was, was a kind of fabrication. Um, he said he, it was a tradition, but also one that he wanted, in a sense, to help invent, um, to be able to classify authors in, in relation to one another. What all of these authors shared was their hostility to liberalism, uh, as each defined it uh, very differently. Um, but maybe he vacillated on um, why... Uh, uh, have these two wings because uh, it seemed to a lot of people like guilt by association. First established that there are basically fascists, uh, you know, maybe Mestre if you buy certainly Isaiah Berlin's presentation of what he stood for, but certainly your countryman here, Carl Schmidt, we could debate Leo Strauss's politics and then show the proximity of of the ideas of uh, even like relatively milquetoast communitarians with those older figures. Holmes wrote, I'm not saying, these are his words, that these recent critics are quasi-fascists or fascist sympathizers or fascists with a human face. But in a way, the whole structure of his book indulged the idea that there was a kind of taint uh, from the past and we can easily assume, uh, I don't know why he hasn't written about these gentlemen, how Holmes might treat Adrian and Patrick. Uh, they're dangerous uh, because many of their core ideas have been deployed before. And I want to come back to whether that should concern us or how it should concern us. Um, so what, what I want to do is just offer three qu more or less quick um, observations about how we might think about the comparison between this crisis of liberalism uh, and Holmes's engagement with it and our own. And uh, I, 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 I'm going to start with just one thing I was thinking about and invite your comments um, before turning to two other comments that I, I'm a little bit more confident about. The first is less substantive. It's more about the relation between crises of liberalism and events and how we should think about that. Because to me, one of the most, okay, this is not legible, but that's okay. One of the most obvious um, facts about crises of liberalism is, is that they can feel like distorted commentaries on a catalytic events that have occurred. Um, and they, they get the, the theorists who attack liberalism, indeed, whatever their intentions, may gain their prominence in part because of events that shock liberals and lead them to look for uh, expl explanation. Um, and I think that was uh, true in the early uh, 20th century crisis of liberalism, where there was a permanent referendum set up on World War I and its political implications, and then the rise of Italian fascism, and then the Great Depression, and then most obviously 1933, um, which made it clear there was, let's say, a challenge to liberal regimes, par at least liberal parliamentary regimes, in process, and it was very important to then have a parallel theoretical referendum. I'd say it seemed, I think it seems to many of us like the same uh, possibility has materialized today where, you know, not to take any credit at all away from Patrick uh, and the brilliance of his uh, book uh, uh, on liberalism, but absent the uh, shocking events of the Brexit vote and then especially uh, the election of Donald Trump, it is doubtful there would be a debate about liberalism occurring uh, today. And so once again, it may seem as if events uh, are absolutely central to these repeated, these cyclical uh, outbreaks of crises of liberalism, debates about it, defenses of it. What strikes me as helpful about this intervening crisis 
is that there are no events. Um, and it might help us think more carefully about what might be at stake in our own crisis of liberalism. Here's what I mean. There uh, was nothing either in the authors that uh, Holmes attacked, sometimes unfairly, and his own often brilliant defenses of liberalism that was presented as uh, in relation to anything going on in the world, except a s slow grind malaise uh, in the West in the case of many of the critics of liberalism of the 1970s and 80s. And indeed, even though he waited to publish his compilation, uh, The Anatomy of Anti-Liberalism, until after the events of 1989 to 91, it's, a, it's kind of a shocking fact that Holmes did not mention the end of communism uh, in his book. He didn't run a victory lap for liberalism, ex explicitly at least, in the way that many of, uh, of the other liberal triumphalists of the 1990s did. So all I have in mind there is that this crisis of liberalism that Holmes is in which Holmes is participating, seems to reflect the fact that maybe crises of liberalism, you know, don't need to implicate events, at least not immediately or necessarily, but have to do with cultural malaise. Um, and maybe that's true of our own crisis of liberalism, that whatever happens in the November election in the United States or the next election here on which IF Day is on the ballot, we will not be able to give up at least some kind of ongoing referendum on whether to keep liberalism, uh, what the pathologies are to which it, le it leads, what cure uh, there, there might be for them. So just to close my first uh, comment, uh, what I think is helpful about doing the comparative history of crises of liberalism is it, it might lead us you know, to, in, in thinking about uh, uh, criticisms of liberalism to detach a, a bit, at least, from the events on which many of us seem to uh, feel that the history of political uh, theory should also uh, turn and have a longer range, a longer term sense of um, what's going to be involved in the future of liberalism, the time horizon over which we might reform it rather than reject it might also change. Okay, uh, my second comment uh, is, is, is going to be about whether looking at old events, in this case, old crises of liberalism, uh, convinces us that there's nothing new under the sun, because that would be a very let's say, enticing interpretation of history. It served liberals, not least in all of the references we've heard in recent years to the interwar crisis. Maybe it should serve us when we look uh, theoretically to this crisis of liberalism of the 1970s and 80s. Uh, as a shorthand, I'll just refer to an American film called Groundhog Day, which you need not watch, although it's excellent. Um, it's about a man who um, wakes up and it's the same day every day and he has to live through it uh, in identical detail each time. And, and then his challenge is to exit this uh, uh, you know, eternal return of the same day. And so you might ask, is there a way in which in spite of you know, the, the sense of excitement that some have felt about the crisis of liberalism or the attempt to you know, man the ramparts and defend liberalism in response. Are we actually reliving almost verbatim something that has been experienced before? And I, I want to suggest that that's partly uh, true. Um, if you wanted, you could even try to find characters from the past who have been partially reincarnated uh, today. And I think it would be a very interesting exercise uh, to do that. This is the table of contents. Uh, of Steve's book, uh, and you can see who's in there. And I think it, it, you could, again, try to say, well, Adrian or Patrick or the other Adrian or whomever is to a significant extent reviving Alistair McIntyre's uh, 
views, which then, if you're a liberal, have been pre-refuted uh, in some old book that you didn't know existed or have forgotten about. I actually was a student of Roberto Unger's and, and am actually trying to intentionally revive his claim that uh, we could have a, what Roberto called a super liberalism, meaning instead of a post liberalism, we could have a, an, an alt liberalism that is better than liberalism but realizes its promise. Uh, and then we would really be in Groundhog Day because one of the frustrating features of Steve's review of my book, you know, 30, 40 years after he wrote these materials, is that he said, Moyne is not honest in attempting to save liberalism. He's actually rejecting it under the, under the pretense of rescuing it, which I don't think is true. But um, point is, you could reduce me to a kind of verbatim copy of someone, and probably you could find other... Uh, examples of how there are, there are repeated themes. Now, I don't want to go too far with this and waste people's time, but I will say that in the excellent second half of Stephen Holmes's book, he does something different than in the first half, which is just like a revised version of the character portraits uh, that he compiled from these magazine takedowns. Um, what he did was try to let's say, enumerate the criticisms of liberalism that have been made repeatedly and routinely by uh, those especially on, on the right over the centuries, uh, and then refute each one. And I think it would be quite interesting to ask, have our post-liberals been pre-refuted because many of the memes in which they engage are these memes? Um, they bowdlerize uh, the history of liberalism. They treat uh, liberalism as a recipe for the dissolution of the common good, of the rejection of authority, of the privatization, especially the economic privatization of human life. Uh, they often complain about rights as narcissistic modern uh, appendages and, and so forth. Uh, so you could go back and ask, are we really, um, you know, uh, could, could one really take many of the arguments in defense of liberalism uh, of the second half of Steve Holmes's book and apply them even to recent anti-liberals? Have, have those anti-liberals successfully grappled with the attempt to say that liberalism uh, has been caricatured, has other resources uh, for answering the criticism of liberalism as uh, atomistic or relativistic than ha has been recently acknowledged. Um, it's only fair to say that as someone who's still alive, Stephen Holmes has also been living his own Groundhog Day since his response to 2016 has been to return to illiberalism studies. Okay, but that as a second comment, I think would, for all of its interests, you know, would, would, would take us limited mileage. I think it would not be a very interesting way of engaging in the intellectual project of the comparative uh, approach to crises of liberalism. Because I think in any comparison, what we should care most about is what's different and new. Um, and I want to get at that by dwelling on some things that uh, do separate at least Holmes and Holmes's role in the crisis of liberalism of yesteryear uh, and the one we're living today. And I, I just want to uh, focus this set of comments, this third set of comments, on two uh, two. Uh, uh, fronts. One, kind of geopolitics, uh, and the other, economics. So it, these two, as in my sense, and I think this is true certainly of myself and of Patrick, these two themes are utterly central 
to the contemporary critiques of liberalism, whether to junk it all together or to fashion some more credible uh, liberalism. I'm quite upset about forms of both liberal internationalism and neoconservative ideology that have led to uh, a half century of war led by my country and in defense of, of the West. And I'm very upset about neoliberalism. And I think one very one place where there is overlap between the left and the right critiques of actually existing liberalism is that they focused intently for all their other differences on the geopolitics of liberalism lately, the militarist geopolitics of, neo of liberalism lately, and the economics of liberalism lately, notably its neoliberalism. And basically my general comment is gonna be that you wouldn't know about these things by looking at Holmes's book. He seems to have nothing to say about uh, war, about American empire, uh, about the reactivation after Vietnam of a certain American interventionist a penchant, nor would you know about the transformations of capitalism that are in full course at the time that instead of looking at those realities, he rises in defense of the liberal tradition, even though he says on practically the first page of his book, that the critics he's addressing are, in his words, harmless. It's quite interesting. I think there was a lot of harmful stuff going down in the 1980s uh, and then in the 1990s. But instead, we have a, a response to the crisis of, of liberalism that chooses to talk about harmless critics of liberalism and not the harm on behalf of liberalism, and I'd argue to liberalism that is already commencing uh, at, at that time. So I'm not gonna say a lot about the, the geopolitical side, but I think it's worth noting that, uh, I think as we've heard earlier in this conference, um, these are essays that are written during the Reagan revolution, uh, which among other things meant a rejection of, uh, of certain forms of more pacifistic liberalism of the past, including a detente approach to the Cold War that had actually been shared across party lines uh, for a time in favor of a more, let's say, militarist and oppositional form of Cold War politics. And the reason that might matter uh, is that it, it continued. I think, after the Cold War was done. And I'm not going to give you a lengthy substantiation of that point, but it's just to say that I don't think um, we should treat the 1990s as a, a halcyon period of peace, but one in which this liberal international, sorry, liberal internationalist, neo-conservative militarist posture actually kind of gets rooted in ways that make uh, the war on terror, both credible and possible when it breaks out. More than that, there's, you know, the, the, the topic we might broach of the relationship to Eastern Europe, uh, the expansion of NATO and so forth and so on. And I just want to mention that eventually it dawned on Holmes himself that liberals could make mistakes. Uh, most notably, uh, he was an, an absolutely brilliant critic, not just of neoconservatives, but the liberals who agreed with them, but only much later, once those relationships became clear uh, after 2003 and the Iraq war. And he wrote an entire book, mostly, again, republished essays about it. He also, as you might know, because it was published uh, in, in a translated form in German, eventually came to think about the recession of liberal democracy in Eastern Europe. I don't have time to go into this. It's a, I think it, it's a quite intricate story and maybe too much trivia. But in the 1990s at the University of Chicago with Cass Sunstein and others, 
Steve was involved in the idea that liberalism uh, could come to Eastern Europe uh, under the right auspices uh, and was involved in something called Eastern European politics, uh, constitutional politics as a, a kind of project which helped engage in constitution writing. Um, but by 2020, he had recognized that liberalism was failing or in certain cases had failed in Eastern Europe. And it's just an interesting fact that in the 1980s and 1990s, when he was publishing screeds against harmless critics of liberalism, he wasn't, let's say, seeing the forces he would later understand have really helped determine geopolitically the meaning of our time. Um, but I really should focus, since I, I don't want to talk too long, on this second part of the third comment, which is about how the last crisis of liberalism treated economics, uh, and especially how the defenders of liberalism against its harmless critics in the 1970s and 80s really missed a chance uh, to think about and to counter, I think, the really dangerous um, causes of the a potential undermining of liberalism today, which uh, I think was the rise of, of neoliberalism. Holmes had nothing to say about this. Now, in fairness, his, those he identified as the critics of liberalism didn't much either, um, either because they were writing too early um, or because they just weren't uh, that sensitive to economics in general. But uh, to me, maybe the most striking element of Steve's work in this period is that he didn't even see it as necessary to have a, a kind of engagement with liberalism's historic relationship to laissez-faire in the 19th century and to neoliberalism in its own time. Part of the reason, I think, is he thought that Marxism had already been theoretically discredited and maybe was bolstered in that conclusion by the events of 1989 to 91. In absolute fairness, he and Cass did write a book about how any credible liberal democracy would need high enough taxation to provide a minimum welfare rights uh, to all citizens. So these are, if you like, left liberals who are, are, are opponents of certain forms of Reaganism and of economic uh, libertarianism that they know are strong in their country, especially as, as University of Chicago professors at, at that time. But there is no more general understanding uh, of what it would take to have a, a credible liberalism that faced down uh, 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 the, the kind of systemic features of political economy. And I want to suggest that that is, is in part because Holmes didn't think that the Marxian form of anti-liberalism was even worth including in the tradition. And I would just say it's this, I think, that, that most distinguishes the current crisis of liberalism from the last one. Even Patrick, or especially Patrick, but also myself, I think have inherited a lot more from Marxism uh, than, uh, than maybe the critics of liberalism in the past did, but maybe Holmes actually missed that too, because where did Alistair McIntyre come from? Where did Christopher Lash come from? Roberto Unger, though a non-Marxist like me, had a, a lot of respect for the tradition as a social theory. And this just wasn't at the focus of the way that Holmes attempted to redeem the credibility of liberalism. So what I want to conclude by saying is that maybe there was a missed opportunity in the last crisis of liberalism. Of course, you can always say there was a missed opportunity to articulate the right criticisms of some idea or set of ideas. But what I want to focus on through the example of Stephen Holmes is 
whether there could be, have been a missed opportunity in the defense of liberalism at this time. Because it's only, I think, fair to ask uh, what liberals could have been doing uh, uh, with their time other than attacking some you know, harmless writers, as uh, Stephen, by his own a- account, did. And my answer is that they could have been setting out at, a, at, at in a way, a moment of their maximum power when they were least challenged by alternatives and rivals. They could have set out to save their tradition from its characteristic flaws, uh, to figure out how to make it appealing and durably appealing, both as a global project, uh, but also as an economic one, which is also going to be economically global. Uh, they should have seen that the, the worst thing one can say about liberalism has always been that it's a set of apologetics for empire. It was directly that in the 19th century, and I believe became that again in our time. And also that it was a set of apologetics for laissez-faire and later neoliberalism. And that's not all it has ever been, but if, it, if those are the serious criticisms to make of liberalism past and present, then it seems as if it would have been much better had liberalism faced those criticisms then uh, and, and possibly transcended them. So let me conclude just by um, saying what, how I've intervened in the debate. Um, unless, um, I, I didn't know when I started. Can I take a few minutes longer or stop? Um, and, and just repeat what I'm taking to be the moral of this talk, which is that we should you know, try again uh, to, to think about how liberalism could be saved from its present impasse. Uh, as I said, if we just read the literature on the crisis of liberalism, Patrick and these respondents, it, 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 is, it, it, it is characterized by a binary, junk or retain. Uh, and uh, what I tried to do was, you know, in, in the spirit of Annalene's earlier talk, to add at least a little something from the current attempts by historians and pro, uh, pro, uh, professors of the history of political thought to better historicize liberalism. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, and uh, that involved you know, losing the early modern origins uh, uh, with John Locke as the libertarian founder looking less at Anglophone origins and more at continental ones and, and thinking harder about the, uh, the post-revolutionary origins of liberalism. And then to insist that there was a drastic mutation of liberalism in the middle of the 20th century, not because there was an absolute rupture, but because in Uh, setting its sights lower, liberalism lost touch with many of its prior goals, emancipatory goals. And just to clarify, because it's been said a couple of times, it's not only that I think liberalism before the Cold War focused more on economics and the social question, though that's true. It's, It's not just social liberalism that I'm trying to revive. And in fact, I would argue that the so-called new liberals were too economistic, much like their heir, John Rawls. I uh, tried to revive a perfectionist liberalism uh, that could could answer the criticism of some post-liberals that uh, liberals privatize the highest good. Uh, And I emphasize liberalism's genetic relationships to the romantic movement in the earlier 19th century. And I also tried to say that liberalism, at least some liberals, had a relationship to futurism and progress that the Cold War liberals purged from the tradition. I think these were meliorist liberals, 
But the Cold War liberalism got rid of that meliorism, which is the problem, not liberal meliorism. Okay, I'm, I'm going to save time by just saying with, with a few more minutes, I could talk a bit about Steve's first book, which I think is a fascinating book because in, in certain in very interesting ways, he projects many premises of Cold War liberalism on Benjamin Constant. Uh, at least he's right to focus on Constant, who was a genuine founder of liberalism. But not only does he primarily want to see Constant as an heir of, of Hobbes, uh, as a member of what he called the politique tradition of early modern liberalism, uh, but he also very intentionally read out uh, both the communitarian Republican strands of Constant's thought, but especially the romantic uh, strands of Constant's thought that I think were utterly essential to all early liberals, including Mill and Tocqueville. So uh, I'll just conclude then. If we do engage in this comparative analysis of crises of liberalism, uh, I think we should focus on something distinctive that happened in the 1980s and 90s when there, there was an otherwise similar repetition of the same old critique of liberalism. And basically, I, I think we should focus on how a chance was missed at that moment for liberals to focus on their mistakes uh, and their suffering from them now. Uh, and uh, we still might want to entertain what I'm calling alt-lib options, uh, <laughs> resources in liberalism that the Cold War spurned, and then that these uh, heirs of Cold War liberalism in the 1980s and 90s uh, also spurned. Uh, but regardless, we have a chance in doing this comparative analysis to think about where our predecessors in the same debates went wrong and how we can uh, make them right. Now, I'll just as a final word, say that it might also be that our crisis of liberalism debate is missing big things too. But of course, if we're missing them, we don't know what they are. So I'll stop there. <laughs>